Um, welcome everyone to our fourth installment of the Watershed Academy's Land Use Impacts and Related BMPs. Today's offering is chock full of good information. We're going to start with forestry BMPs and move on to mining and then finish up with some habitat related BMPs. But first, we're going to jump into forestry land uses and practices that can help protect water quality. Forestry practices occur throughout the state of Kentucky, mainly by private landowners. This map shows broad scale land coverage throughout the state. And you can see that the, we have plenty of remaining forested areas, areas shown in the darker green color. Issues related to forestry are sometimes brought to the att attention of watershed practitioners like us. Um, so it's helpful to know the relevant laws and industry guidance. Oftentimes we just transfer information on to Kentucky's Division of Forestry or the Division of Water, but it is helpful to be informed. So we want to first start out by saying that it's important to remember that forestry forests in and of themselves are water quality BMPs. They provide a multitude of benefits to waterways, including providing tree shading that keeps the water temperatures cool and helps reduce algal blooms. They stabilize the banks with their roots. They filter runoff pollutants before they reach the streams and other water bodies and absorb excess runoff and help prevent flooding. They provide a food source from fallen leaves and, and other woody debris and associated organic matter. And they provide direct habitat through the roots that hang over the streams and fallen wood. With this in mind, we'll consider practices that enable the growing and harvesting of trees in sustainable ways that do not cause unnecessary harm to our stream system. So healthy forests equal healthy waters. And I thought that this map was instructive because it shows that the watershed surrounding our healthiest waters, um, those of the uh, outstanding national resources and cold water aquatic habitat are highly forested, greater than 50% usually, and some of them are even up to 97%. Um, there are a few watersheds in western Kentucky noted in yellow, and um, those are less forested, but those are traditionally prairie lands, and so we wouldn't expect to see them being highly forested now. Although each of the water bodies is protected for the high quality of Kentucky uh, waters consistently feature watersheds with highly forested areas. That's the main point of that graphic. Um, so the Kentucky Agriculture Water Quality Act covers forestry operations, including both silviculture and timber harvesting. Silviculture relates to activities that are used to grow and care for forests and trees, including planting, thinning, and timber stand improvement. And timber harvesting obviously re relates to the activities used to cut and harvest the trees. This act includes the requirement for forest landowners to develop a water quality plan similar to that used for agriculture, other agricultural operations and ensure that it's adhered to during operation. Thus, the development of this plan is one of the first things that should be done when planning a forestry operation. Forests cover nearly half our state and are the foundation of a forest sector that is a major economic force in the Commonwealth. The recent demand for oaks, oak staves in, um, sorry, wine and bourbon industry has greatly increased in recent years, and it's a major focus of our current timber industry. This map shows the distribution of wood industries by dots throughout the state and the number of master loggers by county in the different gradations of green. We'll be talking more about what it means to be a master logger shortly. This these pie graphs are just um, included to show that Kentucky's forest sector is somewhat dominated by the secondary wood 
product industry and paper conversion. And um, to, for some context, I wanted to share um, this graphic that shows the flow and economic contribution of one harvested acre of Kentucky woodland. First, uh, the woodland owner received a payment for the timber sold of approximately $1,000. Then the logger sells the wood to a mill for processing into products such as paper, cross ties, or paper. Next, these products may move on to the secondary industries that I just mentioned, such as cabinet maker makers or industries that convert paper to a final product. This represents the greatest economic value chain. Mill waste or residue, including sawdust, chips and bark are then sold for uses such as mulch or charcoal. And it's important to remember that although the economic payout is less than for other sectors, the initial contribution of the woodlands themselves and its logging is critical to maintaining all these other sectors, thus the need for sustainable forestry practice. More than 95% of the board feet of saw timber harvested annually in Kentucky comes from non-industrial private landowners. To help ensure that these loggers and landowners are well informed on sustainable practices, the Master Logger Program was developed in 1992 by the University of Kentucky's Department of Forestry Extension, the Kentucky Forestry Association, and the Kentucky Division of Forestry. The program was voluntary from 1992 until 2000 when the Forest Conservation Act became law. This act requires water protection BMPs and at least one person on site and in charge that has successfully completed the master logger program. Through this program, loggers complete um, training that includes discussion and demonstration of BMPs for logging and also learn about forest chainsaw safety, personal protective equipment, or PPE as we all fondly know it, and directional felling techniques. Um, master loggers are also required to, um, you, to complete hours of continuing education every three years. Along with this, Kentucky's logging BMP field guide, which was also developed by UK and the Kentucky Division of Forestry. It's a comprehensive field reference to help loggers meet the mandatory BMP requirements for water quality protection. And it provides um, details that loggers should use before, during, and after timber harvesting. When done well, logging can be conducted in a way that provides valuable natural resources with minimal harm to our water resources and aquatic life. Forestry operations can bring about a variety of water quality impacts. Timber harvesting is the most common forestry activity in Kentucky, and its resultant pollution is most noticeable on smaller order streams, which often contain ideal shallow riffle areas that provide abundant habitat. Sediment is the most common logging pollutant in Kentucky. Haul roads, skid trails, and landings, or log decks, are areas of disturbed ground that can erode. Dirt and mud can also be pushed directly into streams. Logging debris, including tops, limbs, cutoffs, and other woody debris that's left in the stream can pollute water. Um, this is because it changes how the water flows and can aggregate, ag aggravate bank erosion that produces even more sediment. Further, the decomposition of logging debris can also result in lower oxygen levels, which harms aquatic life. Water temperature can increase with increased sunlight from the removal of too many trees along the stream. This also can lower dissolved oxygen levels and cause detrimental algae in waters that are high in nutrients. All these impacts can, can negatively affect aquatic life. Fluids like diesel, fuel, gasoline, oil, hydraulic fluid, antifreeze all have the ability to harm aquatic life, and they may come from leaking equipment or improper disposal of fluid containers. <laughs> Controlling these fluids is essential to preventing pollution. 
trash, including the discarded fluid cans and personal litter can obviously contribute to water pollution. And then finally, nutrients and pesticides are another water quality impact. These can result from fertilizer applications to revegetated areas or adhere to soil particles and pesticides may be improperly applied to the silvicultural areas. This graphic shows the relative impacts of these non-point source pollutants with sediment having the greatest impact at the top in the form of added water body turbidity and embedments of the stream bed. Thermal pollution from lost tree canopy and greater sun exposure to the water body is the second greatest impact, causing increased water temperature and results in this, uh, decreases in dissolved oxygen. Other impacts are altered stream flows causing bank cutting and scouring and added organic matter and nutrients from runoff, reducing dissolved oxygen. To combat these concerns, one of the primary BMP recommendations is to avoid using streams as loads, sorry, as roads or logging trails. If no other good alternative exists, their use as roads or for crossing should be minimized. Logging debris and disturbed soil, such as the slash from tops and cutoffs should not be left in or have the potential to be washed into streams. Both of these photos show instances of soil and logging debris that's been left in stream channels, negatively impacting the streams. There is some more leeway with ephemeral channels that only flow during rain events. Some slash may be left in these channels as long as it does not block or potentially block water flow. It's still recommended that these be cleaned up as much as possible um, before equipment has been taken off site in case of you know, problems after logging is complete. Um, but there is, like I said, a little more leeway in the guidance. Photo A in this slide shows a clear ephemeral channel with no debris obstruction, but photo B shows how it can be blocked by leftover debris. The Kentucky Ag Water Quality Plan includes BMPs that are recommended for each of these 10 BMP categories. Research has shown that the timber harvesting activities with the greatest impact on, on water quality are those included in BMP 1 and 3. Log landings, access roads, and skid trails, including stream crossing and stream side management zones. So we're going to focus most on these practices. Again, the Kentucky Ag Water Quality Act requires all landowners who use their property for forestry operations to develop a water quality plan that incorporates these BMPs. And all parties involved in woodland operations, including the landowners, loggers, and silvicultural operators, are responsible for carrying out these practices for water quality protection. unfamiliar with logging terminology, let's begin with a definition of some of the terms. An access road is constructed to connect timber harvesting or some other forest activity with the farm or public road system. Secondary or skid trails are temporary trails used by logging equipment to move logs from a point near where it was harvested to an access road or concentration area. And this concentration area is called and refers to the areas where harvested forest products are temporarily stored before being removed from the woods. It's important to construct and maintain each of these logging features in a way that minimizes soil erosion and protects water bodies from sedimentation. Forest roads are obviously necessary for access, but can cause more erosion than any other aspect of logging. When sediment washes away from timber harvest sites, it usually starts from the erosion from poorly built forest roads. In contrast to the permeable absorbent soils of the surrounding forest, roads create hard compacted surfaces that easily channel runoff. 
On the bright side, good logging road and trail construction can reduce erosion significantly. Here are some of the most important principles of DMP-1 for roads, trails, and landing. They should be built with minimal steepness or grade. The idea is to move small amounts of water over small distances rather than the opposite with greater erosion. Um, to prevent runoff from entering streams or channels, water control structures should be installed at appropriate intervals. Skidders or other logging equipment should not be used when conditions are favorable for rut development, so when they're really wet and muddy. Elevated stream crossings should be used when possible um, to prevent direct impacts to streams. And then finally, recommended practices should be following for stabilizing Temporary, temporarily inactive or permanently retired logging areas. These graphics from the field guide show a water control structure circled in yellow that diverts muddy runoff off of the road so it doesn't stream. Rock can be used at the outlet of the control structure, such as at this culvert, to reduce gully erosion. Stream crossings should only be used when necessary and should be constructed at right angles to the stream by, to reduce erosion by limiting impacted bank lengths. These photos show common examples used for stream crossings uh, with the wooden skitter bridge on the left and then a culvert, which is commonly used to cross ephemeral streams. Crossings can be significant sources of sediment. If attention is not paid to the proper location, the selection of the crossing type and their installation and removal. The four minimum requirements are designed to reduce muddy water runoff, minimize disturbance of the streams, and provide operational flexibility. There are a variety of elevated crossing designs, but topographic difficulties such as bank height or channel width can make their installation difficult. In these situations, fords can be used that allow equipment to move directly over the stream bed. This graphic here shows a pole crossing that was constructed from felled trees on the site. DMP number three relates to stream side management. These are the strips of woodland located adjacent to a stream or other body where only limited disturbance is desirable. This concept should be very familiar to you by now. Um, it's also referred to as a buffer zone, riparian zone, wildlife corridor, or some other name for this protected strip of land. SMZs must be used directly adjacent to streams or water bodies and should be marked prior to logging. If they're not correctly implemented or, or are ignored, it's really difficult to go back and correct problems. They are not required, however, along ephemeral streams. Um, as I've mentioned, these near stream areas in perennial water bodies help with shading, maintaining the integrity of the bank, and reducing sediment from overland flow. Um, with perennial and intermittent streams, there, both of those, there are minimum distances, trails, and landings from the banks where feasible and within these stream side management zones. For SMZs and other forestry BMPs, the steep, steepness and slope distance of the land direct re <laughs> I'm sorry, directly relates to the BMP's effectiveness. Thus, these measurements are needed when designing BMPs appropriately for your site conditions is measured at the slope percent, which is the rise or fall measured in feet over 100 feet of horizontal distance. And BMPs, in addition to SMZs that require uh, consideration of these factors, include uh, spacing of water control structures on the haul roads and spacing of water bars on retired trails and roads. And we'll talk about these a bit more momentarily. Criteria for SMZs is shown in this table. Um, it's the guidance that here you can see the guidance for overstory tree retention by width and percentage of overstory trees maintained. 
and then also the minimum distance to roads, trails, and landings from the stream bank. It includes guidance for three different stream types, regular perennial, intermittent, and then CWAH stands for cold water aquatic habitat, which are streams that naturally support trout populations. So in one example on this slide highlighted here, um, a perennial stream with a slope of 20% would pr require preserving at least 50% of overstory trees to a minimum distance of 50 feet from the stream bank. And roads and trails should be at least 100 feet from the stream bank. This diagram from the Kentucky Master Logger publication further illustrates the SMZ guidance with a graphic depiction. Um, note that the required overstory trees increases with the increased slope on the right as does the distance of the road from the stream. Obviously, these increased restrictions are designed to reduce soil erosion. There are situations where it's not feasible to locate roads, trails, and landings at the required distance. So when they must be located closer to stream, extra precautions are needed to reduce muddy runoff. These include the measures listed on this slide, minimizing road, trail, road and trail grade, preventing water from collecting at low points, and then as shown in photo A, increasing the water control structure frequency. Um, these are water bars that I mentioned a moment ago, and then using logging debris or other sediment barriers to slow runoff, as in uh, photo B. The canopy cover distance by the dashed yellow line and the road and trail distance by the solid yellow line from both a perennial in the solid blue and an intermittent stream. Note that the area D outside of these areas is where logging occurred and you can see that the skid trails were constructed along the contour of the land to help minimize erosion. P number four concerns forested areas in karst topography, which contain sinkhole depressions. So for this BMP, runoff from roads, trails, and landings should not drain directly into sinkholes, sinking streams, caves, and soil and logging debris should not be dumped basically in the sinkhole. The Ag Water Quality Plan also provides guidance on allowable distances between logging-related disturbances and the opening of stinkholes, stinkhole, also called swallow. Forested wetlands, because of their uniqueness and sensitivity, require additional considerations. When silvicultural activities, including harvesting, are implemented in wetlands, BMPs recommend minimizing construction of roads, locating landings on higher ground, and minimizing vehicle traffic. Crossing of streams and sloughs or swampy areas should be avoided if at all possible. Finally, once a logging operation is complete, it's important to leave the land in a state that does not cause future degradation of waterways. This includes attention to any roads, trails, landings, or other areas of bare dirt that were used for timber harvesting. Forestry BMP field guide details multiple retirement measures that need to be satisfied prior to a final site inspection. These include removing ruts and smoothing surfaces and removing constructed berms and temporary stream crossings. It also calls for seeding related practices that ensure revegetation of the area, um, a good covering of grasses and legumes, over retired roads, trails, and landings shows that uh, a conscientious logging, logging job has been completed with attention to all these final requirements. Um, an updated rule as of 2017 requires that at least uh, one other measure to ensure revegetation occur, and that can be um, loosening compacted soil, fertilization, or mulching of the area. And then another uh, update in that rule removes the requirements for retiring, 
lands that are unlikely to drain into stream or channel, so flatter areas in the logged, um, logging operation. Although loggers are not required to notify the Division of, For of Forestry of the operations, it is recommended that they do so when starting their work. Um, once the logging begins, a Division of Forestry County Ranger can visit the site for an initial inspection um, or a periodic compliance inspections and then a final site inspection. Uh, if the inspector finds that a master logger is not on site or the operation is creating imminent or immediate water quality risk, steps can be taken to address the situation. First, a uh, written warning is issued to the owner or operator. Then a compliance inspection occurs to ensure that the correct BMPs have been implemented. If they're not, an, inform, an owner or operator can request an informal conference with the Division of Forestry to discuss the situation and then a, a plan and a timeline are developed to address the issue. If after these steps, the logging operation is still out of compliance, a notice of violation can, is issued stating that the required corrective action and timeline for its completion. If BMPs are still not addressed, a special order is issued that mandates the logger cease all or part of the operation and implement the measures in the NOV. Um, once those measures are implemented, logging can resume. And then finally, if violations are still not corrected, the special order can initiate an administrative hearing. Um, this can result in a $1,000 per violation fine and the logger's designation as what's called a bad actor. In addition to providing a listing of the master loggers in Kentucky, this website also provides a database of bad actors. And mills can choose not to purchase logs from, from individuals listed on this bad actor site, so there can be financial repercussions. And then if a logger wants to get off of this list, there is also a procedure for that, um, which includes complying with the final orders, fix requesting the removal of this designation and then signing a, an agreement that they will notify the Division of Forestry of every logging operation they conduct for the next two years and being NOV free for the two year period following. So, sorry, don't be a bad actor. 